Assalamu alaikum to everybody who's watching and uh I we're just going to start this session which is a very very special session for all of those all of us who identify as feminists who consider ourselves to be students of feminism um because you know it touches upon a lot of pressing issues that feminism faces globally so i'm very very uh, my name is nayab jan i'm an activist a political worker and uh, of course a feminist as well so this has a lot of uh, you know this talk is of a lot of interest to me and uh, here with me the uh, author uh, whose book we're going to you know talk about today against white feminism is uh, rafia zakaria who is uh, you know she's an author she's a columnist um she has uh, written she writes for dawn she writes for cnn she writes for the guardian she writes for the new york times book review and uh, you know loads of other um, you know things in her belt and because i'm so sorry rafia we were short on time so you know your introduction is, is so long and so lovely no, no, uh, i think that's that's enough <laughs> what you said i think people okay okay great so uh, like i said you know we're here to discuss uh, against white feminism i mean the title in itself is very interesting and and before i go on to you know the first question i really want to preface this by saying that um one of the main reasons why i think this conversation is very important is because we live in an era where you know things like diversity and intersectionality have really become buzzwords in you know the global uh, feminist discourse so this is very very timely i'd call it like a timely introspection for all of us and particularly those people who um you know have been uh more powerful uh within more privileged within the ranks of feminism so thank you so much rafia for doing this and thank you to llf for having this conversation i'm going to jump right into the first question i'm very very interested to know according to you know your definition what is white feminism and does one necessarily have to be white in order to ascribe to white feminism First of all, thank you so much, Nayab. Uh, it's good to see you, and uh, I'm, you know, excited that I get to have this conversation with you, uh, one on one, um, and bring bring this book to LLF, you know, participants. Um, in terms of white feminism, you know, it's very uh, simple in a sense. I'm not talk. I'm not. talking about just a white person who's a feminist so i'm not using whiteness necessarily as a, you know what you look like category or what your visible race is uh what i'm interested in is uh as in, in is whiteness as a as a as a particular kind of privilege that can exert dominance over uh, others so in this sense you know you could be brown and be a white feminist if you are doing the work of um, you know propagating white centered discourse white centered um, solutions for problems on and on and on um and in the post colonial context in pakistan it's that aspect of whiteness that is very important and worth worth considering right i mean obviously pakistani society doesn't um, you know we are all brown most of us and um and there aren't very many white people around but what i'm trying to talk about in the pakistani context would be the fact that how whiteness as a concept of privilege for works to suppress our own indigenous narratives uh, works to suppress our own indigenous feminisms uh, and solutions and um, you know and that work uh can be done by brown people just as in fact you know that was one of the you know dominant theories of 
how colonial British, you know, suppressed and subjugated us um, is by creating a class of brown people that essentially do the dirty work of white people for them. So, um, so yeah, so that's what I mean by, by white uh, feminism is a woman who is, um, you know, who may be white, but who is interested in uh, continuing to center whiteness, continuing to use its privilege to dominate and subjugate others uh, and other discourses. Right. Can you, uh, just to take this, this point further, can you tell us a little bit more about the manifestations of this white feminism? Give us a couple of examples. Tell us how, um, you know, what are the ways in which um, mainstream feminist discourse has been dominated by the white feminist discourse? Yeah. Um you know, I mean, obviously, if you're talking about uh, Western societies, you're experiencing whiteness, you know, constantly, right? Because you, you, you in, a, in a sense, whiteness defines itself um, against those who are not white. So you're constantly uh, so, so there is a, a sense within those diverse environments, it's the, the sort of um, assumption that, uh, you know, what uh, the solution that a white person comes up with is a solution for everyone, whereas a solution that a brown person comes up with is a solution only for brown people, if that. So, you know, that's one uh, aspect of it. Other aspects, uh, you know, within the global context is the position given to uh, the narratives, I mean, for, in our case, of brown women um, uh, globally. So the example I would give is that, uh, say, Chalo, you know, an organization is having a conference, large international NGO is having a conference. Um, they, they will include brown narrative. They will invite people from Pakistan. But, um, you know, those people are reduced to a niche in which they just tell stories of um, trauma. Whereas, right. yeah, whereas, um, you know, uh, the policy making, the agenda setting, uh, you know, the development of programs is all done by white people. Uh, so, so in that sense, too. So, I mean, you know, in that sense, there's a reason why, for instance, in the book, I talk about uh, the clean stoves project in India. Uh, ke, you know, it, this was like this golden solution that was going to, uh, you know, provide women in rural Rajasthan with uh, these amazing clean stoves. And hundreds of millions of dollars were spent on this. And it turned out that the women didn't want to use the stoves. And, you know, they said, look, I mean, we like the old stove. We like not only do we like the old stove, but uh, the, this new thing that you've given us sort of distorts uh, the way we understand society and our role in it. But point being, it was as simple as talking to these women, right, to figure out, okay, yeah, this isn't going to work. But nobody did it. And um, in the research for this book, I found that happening constantly. So, you know, the first time you see a project, a development project, for instance, that um, is a fail, you think, okay, well, I mean, you know, uh, these are risky ventures and it didn't work out. But, you know, when you're doing the research and you find the sixth and seventh <laughs> um, development project and it's also failing, uh, you start to see that a lot of these development projects aren't really intended to be successful. Uh, what they are intended to do is sort of um, provide a kind of cover for the dominance of whiteness uh, by saying that, look how benevolent white people are. Um, and, um, and that, I, I believe, is the problem, you know, and that is very pervasive in uh, white feminism is, you know, projects that aren't necessarily 
developed in consultation with actual brown women and what they may or may not need, or black women and they, or what they may or may not need, but projects that are simply created so that the donors can feel good about, oh, you know, I saved this brown woman from this horrible situation, etc. cetera. Um, and I think that that's a very condescending and problematic dynamic, um, which is sort of, you know, duping people uh, for, into believing that, um, you know, that whiteness is a benevolent force rather than uh, a, a dominating and subjugating force. So we were talking about the, the manifestations of, uh, you know, the, um, of, of this particular whiteness and you were telling us about how it, um, how the ideas that white women have are, you know, intrinsically considered superior and how, you know, the participation of a lot of brown women in international NGOs and things like that is, uh, you know, also something problematic. I want to kind of also talk about a related theme over here, which is tokenism. I think which, uh, you know, we must touch upon. So how do you think, how and why do these types of events, these types of conferences, panels, how and why do they fall prey to this tokenism and, and how can they, you know, kind of mitigate against it? Well, um, you know, that is the problem that animated me, my work as well, is that, you know, I, I felt like ever since I, you know, was aware and, um, you know, small, I, you hear about projects over projects for women's empowerment, um, you know, this NGO, that NGO, or um, just within the global discourse. But at the same time, you know, you see that the problems are not abating, despite there are, you know, tens of millions of dollars that are being spent. And so that's the question. I mean, I then started to feel this inherent discomfort in these kinds of global convenings um, or even, you know, uh, people running projects in Pakistan and Karachi. So um, that's what bothered me. And I wanted to dissect exactly what it is about them that bothers me. And, mm -hmm. and that is what I discuss in the book is that, um, you know, it's very easy to tell a Pakistani, invite some, a few Pakistani women to your conference. And, you know, they will come and they'll sit and they'll be very visible and, you know, a kind of put in a place where they're exoticized. And, um, but then, of course, they would not be given any uh, say in any particular policy that's been developed. So, you know, so you're there to provide an example. Oh, look, the, these brown women, they're activists, your English is so good, blah, blah. But, um, you know, but not in terms of <laughs> their planning meetings, and, uh, you know. But, I mean, it's true. That is how they talk. And, um, and I saw this at Amnesty, you know, when I got on the board of Amnesty International USA, I um, I would see that, you know, uh, Pakistani women, Afghan women, Iranian women, et cetera, et cetera, were all invited to conferences and they were given a like a visible front facing um, role, but they never, mm. ever were part of planning and priority setting. Mm. And so so that is what I mean by tokenism is that if you just want to, you know, like just apne apni kameez pe ya koi bow laga diya ya button laga diya. So it's, yeah. it's, it's there, right? But, but you're not changing the structure of the kameez. <laughs> and that's mm. how I would describe it is that, you know, to, to be really inclusive, you have to change the structures because you can't expect people with uh, different backgrounds. Someone, for instance, ha who has been raised in an aid-receiving aid country like Pakistan, you can't expect that you will just absorb them within your system and yeah. not allow them to transform the system. So mm -hmm. the antidote to tokenism is transforming the system. But um, that is something that 
you know, anytime anybody is evaluating a project or what is happening, that is the question that that it's necessary to ask is that, okay, there's X number of, uh, you know, brown or black or Asian people here, but uh, what sort of say do they have in the actual structure of the program? And yeah, so, so I think that that is key and it's particularly key in terms of women's empowerment, right? Because um, if you have had a, I mean, and you know, you're you're a grassroots activist, so you know this that you know if you have that experience of working in the grassroots in in um, environments where which are very extremely patriarchal, um, you you are going to have a very different uh, conception of what. Mm-hmm will actually make a difference in women's lives versus, you know, someone sitting in a suburb somewhere in New Jersey and, uh, you know, setting up a program. Um, But that is the the disparity that exists is that, you know, the, the voices that can and like provide valid critiques of these programs uh, are not included in the discussion. Absolutely. And I want to move on to, I think, perhaps uh, the most sort of interesting part of the discussion is where you talk about sexual liberation and how white feminism has become intertwined uh, with, you know, this idea of uh, performative kind of sexual liberation. And I think a lot of people will uh, misunderstand that to mean that you are against the idea of sexual liberation or sex positivity, etc. So tell us, are you against sex positivity and sexual liberation? No, I'm not. Uh, I'm not against, uh, you know, sexual liberation or sex positivity. But, um, you know, I... I'm a person who thinks that performativity is a sen- in an, in essence inauthentic. So that I feel that, you know, if you have to kind of act out your liberation uh, mm-hmm. all the time, that's not really liberation uh, mm-hmm. because it, it, it's, it does that because it means that it hasn't become organic and it's kind of top down. Um, yeah. The part that I critiqued was that. Uh, was a you know a particular development um, that sort of saw um, women developing economic power in the West, and at at the same time as sexual mores were being questioned, and this sort of uh, which was a you know happened to be at the same time that capitalism started to rise to yes. um, the high, you know to dominance and so it was very easy at that point to choose the version of feminism that would sell right mm-hmm. and and that is what right so that's that's exactly what happened so that you know you have shows like sex in the city which they're not just showing sexual liberation they're saying not this is how you perform sexual liberation and and that sexual liberation is in the shoes and it's in the dresses and it's in these you know there's a very consumptive aspect to it um and right and that is almost always uh performed by privileged upper class women white women right you know i mean you won't see any black women on shows like that uh, which is you know in itself tells you uh, a lot about whose sexuality is valued and con- and considered worthy yeah. both of protection as well as propagation um and so so that was my um you know that that is my critique is that i hate the fact that you know they that one paradigm sex positive paradigm is uh, used as like you know a frame that's then imposed on all these other feminism all around the world and nobody bothers to question uh, you know i mean why should i fit into this frame i mean you know i can be empowered and liberated but not perform sex sex positivity or sexual liberation um and yeah yeah so i i found that a very exclusionary concept because mm-hmm. it meant that you know say take asma jahangir for instance you know one of my 
childhood icons that I looked up to. Uh, yeah. You know, she's not going around in heels and like, uh, you know, saying, oh, I'm sexually liberated, so I'm going to show my midriff every day. Like, it's fine if someone wants to do that, but it, there shouldn't be pressure to do that, to, you know, be considered, a, 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 you know, an empowered woman. Um, and that that was my critique because it's a very clever way of then excluding huge swaths of the world, uh, Pakistan included, from the discussion about empowerment. Yeah, I think it also kind of plays into the hands of uh, patriarchy in the sense that patriarchy has always said that clothing and empowerment are intrinsically linked. So when we say that uh, this particular kind of clothing is liberating and that particular kind of clothing is inhibiting, these ideas are so arcane now. I mean, I think we need to, we've seen the most, Absolutely. you know, the most um, the warriors for women's rights who can be burqa clad as well, who can wear scarves, Absolutely. who can wear anything. And so definitely Absolutely. a very, uh, you know, stereotypical understanding of women. Uh, just to come to like the concluding note, uh, two questions. The first one, I also want to touch uh, a little bit on, on the capitalism aspect of this a lot more because I think that's, that's very interesting. Do you think that white feminism and the way that it has been appropriated uh, both by the state and by uh, capitalism, do you think it inhibits the transformative and radical potential of feminism in general to be sort of like an anti-capitalist force? Uh, you know, you're, you, you said it perfectly. Uh, it couldn't be really said uh, any better. The fact is, is that, uh, you know, the, the, any time uh, a radical idea or perspective or movement is co-opted by a government or, you know, by a larger capitalist system, say a corporate corporation, uh, uh, it, it loses its fangs. And I'll tell you why, because, I mean, because you, you see this happening actually even now. I mean, I, I was in a discussion with um, some people in Berlin, uh, in Germany, because their foreign minister has said that they have a feminist foreign policy. And, um, you know, and so, of course, here you see like very particular um, joining of state and then this idea of empowerment and feminism by a female foreign minister. Um, but the fact is, is that when, at least until now, every time that has, that has happened, uh, it's more, it's, it's feminism that is being asked to compromise uh, to, below, you know, to get state approval rather than the other way around. And, and that is where I see the problem is that, you know, I mean, uh, and of course you saw it in Afghanistan uh, with US NATO forces. Uh, they used feminism saying, we're gonna go liberate Afghan women, liberate Afghan women. Yeah. Um, and of course, like, you know, you can see that the lack of critique from the American feminist was absolutely key and instrumental for Afghanistan becoming a, the disaster that it is. Mm -hmm. And where are they now, right? I mean, you, you don't hear Gloria Steinem giving daily speeches on, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Afghanistan anymore, because, mm -hmm. um, because that's a done deal. And now we're going to, you know, the US is going to go, like, worry about Ukrainian women, or so on and on. But it's, um, and the point is the same, is that any time, uh, like I, the, the way I envision feminism ideally is as a check on government power instead mm -hmm. of like following. I mean, as a person individually, of, of course, you know, we all have our political views and uh, we should always have the freedom to follow them. But uh, as a movement, I think that uh, it is absolutely necessary for feminism to exist as a check on, uh, you know, on what a government does and what states do, uh, because because yeah, because states are patriarchal, and so absolutely. that that absolutely. has. 
I, I, I love this idea of it being a check. I think that's something that really resonates with all of us. And uh, just coming to uh, the last question, I think since you are talking about what you envision feminism to be, and since this is about your book and your ideas, I really want the ending note to be because we're talking about transformative potential and we're talking about what we see feminism to be. So what does a truly intersectional feminism look like to you? Uh, I think a truly intersectional feminism has to have considerations of race tied within it. So for instance, when we're reading the history of British India, uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about the British, what they did, et cetera, about various other, you know, Indian than what they did. There's no specific discussion of how that racial difference, you know, the white man versus the brown man, uh, how that racial difference played out and what it did. And I'll tell you, uh, there, I'll end on this, that um, when uh, women in Britain won the vote in early 1900s, uh, they came to, uh, you know, Sarojini Naidu and other uh, Indian women who were part of the, um, you know, anti-colonial movement. And they said, well, you guys need to also start a campaign for the vote. You have to start a campaign for the vote, a women's vote in India. And, uh, you know, one of these women looked back and said, I don't want to be equal to brown men since all brown people are enslaved mm -hmm. to you. So I would like to be free from you. And then, I, of course, I want the vote. And as soon as we have our independence, we will have our vote. Um, but there is no point of having a vote if we are, you know, a, a colonized, uh, subjugated place. Um, and that is how I think of it, is that, you know, every it's a huge task that confronts feminists today, is to look through the narratives of empowerment and see how our racial differences, whether they're at the global level or just at the level, I mean, you know, where does, uh, what needs gets prioritized? There's, like, mm -hmm. you can't avoid it. So, that is the task for future feminists is to cast that eye that uh, that includes um, race as part of the consideration and it's not just empowerment and i mean and it's tough because even now uh, books are being written by about pioneering british women and all of those <laughs> women were racist and you know but nobody points that out. They're con still considered heroines. And uh, so we have, you know, we have to do work within our societies, within Pakistan, within Islam. And then we have to do this larger global work, keep that in mind. And, um, you know, so that our perspectives get the value and worth that they have. Absolutely lovely. And I love that story about uh, brown women getting the right to vote. I think that's an excellent story to uh, end this conversation on. Thank you so much, Rafia. This was so enlightening and such a uh, pertinent and relevant discussion. And I think we uh, you know, are left with a lot of questions as feminists, as activists, as women, you know, how we want to take this movement forward and how we want to shape, uh, you know, uh, just the world in general. So thank you so much. And thank you to LLF. And um, it was an absolute pleasure. Thank you.